Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to episode two of our uh, corporate sponsorship webinar series. Um, my name is Evan. This is uh, Kerry, who's uh, president of uh, Cosmo Sports and Entertainment. Um, so again, just before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, very big thanks to Central Counties Tourism and Sport Durham for uh, hosting the webinar series and, and giving us the opportunity to, uh, to put on this, uh, this workshop. Um, so thank you very much to, to both of them. Uh, again, if the slides are a little bit difficult to see, we're going to make all the slides available uh, to anybody who's registered for the webinar afterwards. So um, if there's anything that you can't really see on the, on the slides or if you want to uh, just listen and, and not worry about taking notes, uh, you'll get all the slides afterwards uh, as well. Uh, Q&A. So we're, we're going to spend the last few minutes of the uh, presentation doing some Q&A. Uh, please feel free to submit questions at any point throughout the presentation. Um, there's, if you're looking on the YouTube page in the top right corner, there's a live chat, uh, box, uh, that you can submit questions to, uh, Rebecca, um, our colleague here is, is here and, and she's keeping an eye on all the questions and, and we'll try to address all of those at the end of the, uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, if for whatever reason, a uh, question comes to mind after the webinar is done, um, something that, uh, didn't really make sense or that you'd like to, um, uh, that you'd like to, to clarify with us, please feel free to uh, to send us an email. Uh, if you go to cosmosports.com uh, and look at our staff page, uh, Carrie's email's there, my email's there, or you can email info at cosmosports.com. Um, happy to, to answer any questions or, or clarify anything from uh, from today's presentation. So uh, with that, we'll uh, we'll get into uh, episode number two. So so episode number one, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we started off the, the webinar series talking about what sponsors want and uh, really trying to understand exactly what um, what their objectives are, how to understand when they say things like awareness, um, what does that actually mean, and, and how can we as uh, properties and, and organizations that are selling sponsorship, how can we uh, deliver the level of service that, that they're looking for? Um, so the next kind of natural question, once we've answered that question of what sponsors want is, well, what do we have to offer them? Uh, and that's really what we're going to get into today is how do I identify all the opportunities that your, uh, that your organization has from a sponsorship standpoint and how to get a, a, a ballpark anyways, at least of, of what, what's that worth and, and how much should I, um, should I be charging for this? So, um, so Carrie, just, I guess, just as, as a kind of a start, I mean, this is a question that we're asked quite commonly and, yep. and I can say, you know, even, you know, for myself starting out in, in working in sponsorship and a lot of our staff that start out, you know, working in sponsorship, this is a, just a real, a, a question that people don't necessarily um, have a very straightforward answer to. So why do you think it's such a common question? Well, I think um, it's confusing. I think for people who haven't been in sponsorship, it's, and it really is just like advertising, you know, somebody could say, well, what's it worth to buy a quarter page ad in a newspaper? What's it worth to buy a space on your Facebook page? What's it worth to, you know, but that's a tricky thing, especially for people who haven't done it. So really there's a, it's an important exercise to figure out, look, what, what do we have? What are, is the available inventory? And I think it can be, at first it's kind of intimidating, which is, well, how do, how would I know what a sponsorship package or somebody buying a sign in our arena, how do I know what's that, what that's worth? And I guess what I say is everything's priced like that. How do you know what a coffee's worth? Or how do you know? It sometimes can be a little easier when um, you buy something for two dollars and you think, okay, I bought it for two dollars, I can sell it for four. Um, if you didn't pay the two dollars and you're trying to determine what to sell something for, which is a service, uh, and you haven't gone through that exercise, it it can be hard sometimes. Or it's a it's a product, but it doesn't have a hard intrinsic value. So, anyways, just say it is important. For those who think it's confusing or tricky or they haven't done it, I think uh, you're not alone. I think it's it's an important part of the process, but it's not always straightforward. For sure. Um, so, so with the the appreciation that it you know it's a tricky question for uh, for a lot of people to to answer, and, and we're going to go through um, we're going to discuss kind of both sides of of how to value sponsorship from a from a little bit more of an objective standpoint, um, and then trying to get a little bit more of an understanding of the subjective and really what drives the value of sponsorship. Um, Cause as, as Carrie said, it's not as simple as what the cost was to, to produce it. And then, you know, putting in a healthy margin, it's a, it's a little bit uh, more abstract uh, than that. So, uh, so some of the, the hopeful takeaways that, um, um, that we want everybody to, to take away from today's webinar first, 
is we're going to go through a, a fairly step-by-step -step process on how to identify uh, the assets that your organization has and how to uh, at least get an initial ballpark uh, value of what um, of what you can a price tag that you can put on those on those assets. Um, we're gonna, again, we're going to look at it from an ob objective and a subjective standpoint, trying to understand, um, you know, from from a subjective standpoint, what drives the value uh, and how that value changes based on on who you're selling to. Uh, and lastly, we're going to talk about just how to articulate that value to a sponsor. Um, so touching on the topic that we're going to be addressing later on in the webinar series, but um, once you've understood all the, all the assets that you have, how do you articulate that to a sponsor to really show them the value um, of those assets? So, uh, so to start off, uh, before, just before we get too far in, we just wanted to clarify some, uh, some language that you're, you'll hear us kind of using and, and want to make sure we're all talking the same language. So we've, we have an example here of a, of a client of ours, the, the Brampton Beast Hockey Club. Um, so there's there's different terms that you're going to hear us um, hear us use, and we wanted to, to clarify those here. So first, you know, organization. I mean, very straightforward. Just your company, or in this case, in our example here, the team itself, the Brampton B Star, are the organization. When looking at it from a sponsorship standpoint, we break down that organization into different properties. In the case of the Brampton Beast, uh, there's the in arena assets where the, the the pro team, the pro hockey team actually plays. So there's things like rink boards and backlit signage, and there's a video board. So there's all those assets that happen in the arena. Uh, so we put those as, as one property. There's the team's website and the team's social media and the team's app and, and things like that. And we, we lump those together into a digital and web property. And then third, in, in our case, uh, you know, the team's lucky to, to have the, the rights to the community rinks at the Powerade Center as well. So uh, an additional three ice pads with uh, their own set of assets. And uh, so we categorize that as its own third property. And, and, and just what I would say, this applies, you know, I, I think some of the examples you can look and say, well, we're not a hockey team. How does this apply? I think in general there you have in facility, you have um, uh, properties related to your entity itself. So if you're having a festival or an event, there's the properties attached or the assets attached to the event itself. There's the online uh, corollary assets. What's the digital and online? And then the third element, which we put community here is, are there any tertiary assets that are in addition to the um, event itself, maybe the facility? So maybe if you're running an event at a facility, you could look and say, okay, the festival assets, but are there any facility assets that are above and beyond that? So really it's saying your entity itself, your online component, the people that aren't physically there. And then the third one is, so is there anything, can you go above and beyond that? Is there anything tertiary or additional? Yeah. And this, again, the, the way of breaking down organizations into properties, again, is very organization specific. So each one's going to have a slightly different breakdown and it really is based on preference. So in this case, uh, with this example, you know, we wanted to uh, share these three, but could be, could look very different for, for your organization. Um, so for each of the, the properties, each property has its own set of assets. Um, uh, and there, there could be some crossover. So, you know, the community rinks and the in arena in our example here, both have rink boards as, as an asset. Um, so the assets are all the, all the things within that property that uh, you can leverage for, for sponsorship. So just off the, right off the bat, we just wanted to clarify that language because you're going to hear us using the words assets and properties uh, throughout the whole presentation. So if, if you'd like to, um, and you may find it easier to, to do so um, with the recording of this webinar, but again, as I mentioned off the, at the beginning, we're gonna go through a step-by-step -step process of how to identify and value assets. And uh, we're gonna be using a spreadsheet to, to build out uh, what our final product is, which is a populated spreadsheet with all the assets divided into properties with, um, with benchmark values and, and reach and descriptions and all that kind of thing. So, um, so if you want to follow along and do the steps as we go, feel free. You may find it easier to do that after, uh, afterwards. Um, the reason that we, we do this and this kind of being part of that objective process of valuing assets, assets is, uh, one, it helps keep the team organized. So you'll know what inventory is available, what's, what's been sold. Um, you've done the homework of, of kind of what, what's it worth. And particularly in situations where you might have more than one person who's actually selling assets, uh, having a, a, a listing of assets with um, with kind of rate card values to them helps make sure that similar assets are not sold for vastly different uh, amounts. Uh, so it kind of keeps pricing a little bit more consistent. So, um, yeah. 
Great. So, so the first step when it comes to uh, identifying opportunities and identifying assets is is actually kind of a, a fun activity and, and um, gives your you know gives you and your team an opportunity to be really creative. And it's really you know whether it's a whiteboard or a flip chart or something, it's it's pulling the team together and trying to think of all the places that are related to to your um, to your organization and your properties where a sponsor could be recognized. Um, so, a, kind of an easy way to kind of think about it is you know. Where can, where can we put a logo or where can we recognize the sponsor? Um, and really just listing all of those out. Um, and you want to involve a lot of people from, you know, if you're in a bigger organization, you may want to involve people from different uh, departments. Um, if you're you know, in a smaller organization, it's really, you know, it can be fun to in involve the whole team and, uh, and come up with all the different places where sponsors can be recognized. Um, now, you may find it easier to, to list out the assets first and then, you know, looking at your list of assets, you may find, okay, there's natural groupings for, for properties. You may want to identify those properties first and then build out the assets from there. It's really a, really a preference thing. Um, but uh, but you, want to, you want to build out this initial list anyways, everything, all the ideas that you can think of and, and get them out onto paper or a whiteboard. Um, now, this example here, you know, not by any means meant to be exhaustive or, um, uh, or anything like that. It's... Um, and, and there really is no no end to the, the number of assets you can list, and um, so you don't want to get hung up on getting it all, getting them all down on paper right off the bat. You want to be flexible and and um, leave some room for creativity to create some new assets. And um, so, Carrie, I know you've you've had some some examples of where you know, even in a meeting, um, you know, maybe an asset wasn't identified, but in the meeting, you know, an idea comes up from when chatting with a sponsor, and all of a sudden you have a new piece of it. Um, yeah, and, and I think we talk about uh, and one of the themes that you'll get. For those who are at the in-person presentation or online is that it really is about the customer uh so in the sense when you're you know I, i've been in a situation i think one that i like is if any of you work with um waste management or there's a company called miller waste or 1-800 junk and i was in a meeting one time uh looking at a you know an arena it was actually a tour of the arena looking at all kinds of different assets and and the discussion came out about the garbage cans. Now, you, you don't think in an arena the garbage cans is an asset. Well, if any of you are on this call and you're talking to 1-800-JUNK, for instance, my guess is they're going to be more interested in the garbage cans than anything else you have in the building. So can they sponsor that? And that's sort of a discussion that um, asks, you know, but you really have to get to understand the company. If you're really listening if you're an active listener and you're understanding what's interest, you know, of interest to them, you'll different forms of inventory. I've seen um, uh, railings on escalators as part of inventory, or floor space, or stairs, or um, we do something in Kitchener where the pita pit sponsors the penalty box because it's a pit and it relates to their name. And if you don't think of that they probably wouldn't be sponsoring the team at all if they weren't sponsoring the penalty box well that's not a defined asset it's not even the signage it's the pet in the penalty it's the penalty box itself so um i really go back to listening and you know a lot of times inventory can be created on the fly but don't don't expect pita pit's going to come up with the penalty box that's on you person so listening that that's your responsibility be creative don't expect that 1-800 junk is going to come up with the garbage cans idea they're not in the sponsorship business that's not their job to come up with creative forms of inventory but by listening um swiss chalet sponsors the chicken dance uh, we're talking about ramped beast at ramped beast hockey games it's not random yeah. that they're doing that they're not sponsoring you know another song uh so i think and they're you know they're willing to they, they can relate to that and they're willing to invest money in that type of inventory. So I think, again, it's have some fun with it, but also uh, be open to creative inventory that matches specifically with the company. The, the mistake on a lot of these asset valuations is they're too generic. Um, gold, silver, bronze, ABC. The company doesn't generally care about that. So it's a starting point. And I think that's part of what taking inventory is about it's a starting point it's a benchmark but it's very rarely the ending point right. and i think that you can get caught up in um so maybe another way. B 
build a gold package, but don't expect anybody to buy it. So I don't remember listening. That's a pretty important point. Don't expect anybody to buy it as written. It's not, you know, be flexible that you have to have it and you have to build it. But, you know, people are going to take something from package A and something from package B and something down here and something that wasn't even on your menu. And that's typically what good partnerships are all about. Yeah, so really, really keeping in mind, you know, tying it back to their objectives and, and um, you know, making sure that it really does align with what their objectives That's are. That's right. Can go a little bit crazy with, with the inventory and, um, you know, listing things that really don't help achieve their goals. So. Right. So, so at this stage, um, if you're following along with the, with the spreadsheet, um, you want it to kind of look something like this. So formatting, uh, so the orange bar at the top, just your organization name, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, yellow, you're kind of sub, uh, subdividing your, your spreadsheet into your different properties that you've identified. And then quite simply here, you're just listing out all the assets uh, that you and your team have identified and providing a little bit of a description for each one, uh, just so you know, for future reference, kind of what it is. But, um, Great. So, so now that you kind of you have a, a full list of all your your assets and you've divided them into properties, uh, now comes kind of the fun part of uh, trying to understand a little bit of what each of those assets is worth. Um, so we've, as a starting point, we've provided a bit of a uh, a guideline that you can use just for more so for quick math kind of purposes. So not uh, not over not getting overly in depth into valuing um, uh, valuing each of the the assets, but really if you're just trying to figure out quick math. Am I even in the right ballpark? So, so the first at the top there, um, any paid media. So you may have uh, cases where the local newspaper, um, you either purchase uh, media from them or they donate it in kind uh, to your event. So they've already kind of done the work for you in that case. So you want to use the, kind of the retail rate um, that they've set for their, for their media. So if you're promoting your event and you are attaching a sponsor to that, if that newspaper ad is $500. Uh, well, for one sponsor to, to be recognized on that newspaper ad is $500. So pretty, uh, pretty straightforward there. And then if you're going to include multiple sponsors, um, for each sponsor, the value goes down slightly because they're, they're not uh, as exclusive anymore. So, you know, quite simply, if it was $500 for one sponsor and you have two sponsors, $250 each is, is kind of a good place to, uh, a good place to start anyways. Um, with your owned media, so the things that you are in direct control of, so the things that are at your event, whether it's signage or PA announcements, your website, things like that, a good guideline to, to start from is about a penny per impression. Um, so we talk here in terms of a per impression, uh, and we'll touch on it a little bit later as well, but you know, CPM is another term that you, that you may hear, and quite simply, all CPM is just cost per thousand, um, and that's a very common term in, in advertising and sponsorship. Depending on your organization and the size of your audience and your reach, you may find it easier to uh, figure out a, a per impression rate. Uh, if you're talking about thousands and thousands of people, you might find it easier to talk in terms of a CPM uh, for, for math purposes, but uh, a good place to start. And the M, by the way, is it's thousand Roman numerals. I think yeah. some people, it sounds <laughs> obvious, but it's always people saying, well, why CPM and not CPT? Right, yes. Yeah. Um, and the... Uh, uh, so a good place to start anyways is that is that penny per impression so i know i know when i first heard this um it uh you know it seemed a little low to me and and i think um i think for a lot of people that hear it first uh, that, you know it might a penny might seem a little low to them as well um you know we don't even use pennies anymore so right. um you know what, what are your thoughts on, on that carrie and just well i mean it's an impression you know impressions are very loose uh, you know, I don't think it's too, I don't think it's low. I think if, you know, I think it's where it should be. If I'd probably, if I had to pick one, I'd probably say it's high, but I wouldn't say it's low. I think that, you know, when you see these numbers, you know, Facebook numbers and or website numbers, and we had 623,000 impressions, you got to realize what an impression is. It's literally, um, there's no activity. There's, um, so it, you know, I think the next steps of it are people views, clicks, opens, there's other elements, you know, how many people are engaged and looking and, you know, there's, there's more, far more advanced analytics, the average, you know, what's the average person at time, you know, time someone's looking at an ad or on a website or, uh, to me, I think the, the, the number's right because, um, you've got to get, a, you know, it's the beginning of, it's a very beginning of a process. You've got to get a lot of impressions 
to get somebody to actually make a buying decision. Right. Um, and one thing uh, to clarify kind of at this point um, before we kind of get too far is that this initial valuation process is really about the, the media value. Uh, we're going to get into what kind of differentiates um, your media versus you know, buying a Facebook ad or buying display ads through Google or, or things like that. Um, so right now we're really just kind of talking about how to value the, the media uh, of that. So um, so to brought, just to provide a couple kind of examples of some really common inventory that uh, or assets that, uh, that a lot of uh, people that are on this call probably have with their events. Uh, website, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, websites in general, you know, can range anywhere from, you know, less than a penny per impression to, you know, 13 cents per, per an impression is kind of an industry standard. Um, again, you know, it might be a little bit tricky to see on the slides here, but uh, we're, we're going to be sending this out afterwards. And um, so you can use it for, for reference purposes. But um, the thing to keep in mind with, you know, with website uh, in particular is that it's not so much about uh, what's your total traffic to your site. It's it's how much traffic and unique users are coming to a page in particular that you're that you're sponsoring. So if you're if you're going to sell the, uh, a native ad on your homepage to to a particular sponsor, you want to look at how many unique users are you getting to your homepage, not necessarily what the total uh, web traffic is coming to your um, to your site. Uh, so PA announcements are another really common one. Uh, again, um, you know a range of somewhere from you know, less than a penny up to uh, seven cents per impression is a is a Kind of industry standard for, for PA announcements. Keeping in mind again, um, trying to value that based on how many people actually are likely to hear the PA announcement, as opposed to what the total traffic through uh, through an event is. Um, product sampling is another very common one uh, with uh, events and, and festivals and uh, you know properties that are selling you know ten by ten spaces, things like that. So those tend to range anywhere from five to twenty cents per sample. Um, again, as a, as an industry standard. Um, you know, on the higher end, if it's a little bit more targeted on the lower end, if it's, you know, something like a, an exit sample where everybody that's leaving the, the event is, is getting the sample. Um, so uh, property publication, you know, a lot of a lot of properties will have a, a program or something like that where they recognize a lot of their sponsors. Um, very common. So again, that that one's going to range anywhere from kind of less than a penny to you know, seven cents per, per impression. On site signage, very similar. Um, I assume pretty well every event that's on the call here probably has a signage as, a, as an asset and an inventory. So um, again, somewhere in that kind of less than a penny to, to seven cents uh, per impression is, is the industry standard anyway. So. so using kind of those industry standards, using your penny per impression as a, as a bit of a benchmark, um, you can start to develop a bit of a, a rate per impression or a CPM for, for your different assets. Uh, and that really is kind of the first variable in the equation of, of trying to understand what uh, all your assets are worth. The second is the reach and how many people is that um, is that particular asset reaching, and um, uh, and that obviously that's that's going to have a big influence on on what a particular asset is worth. Um, but in the previous slides, we were talking a lot about you know different ranges for for values on on different assets. So. Um, obviously, you know, the, the people that are on this call want to, they want to try to generate as much value out of their, their sponsorship assets as they can. Um, what, what sort of factors do you think kind of can influence that value? So, you know, that they can get on a little bit higher end of that, that range, as opposed to, you know, on the lower end where you're kind of talking less than a penny or so. You're saying from a subjective or a objective standpoint? Well, both, I guess. I think subjectively, I think that the question is, what is a, what is an impression really? I mean, what is the value that people are getting from it? I mean, I don't know if, uh, I know we were going to talk a little bit about the concept of loyalty. I think that um, sometimes being a smaller event, and you know, I know a lot of people on the call may say, hey, it's a smaller event, it's just me, it's just two people. You have a big advantage. Um, you may think you have a disadvantage, you have a big advantage. And, and the advantage is, by having less sponsors or less people being inclined to be involved and also potentially being able to get more out of it, there's a tendency to have a high level of loyalty and loyalty makes each of those impressions more valuable. If people are going to be at uh, you know, a fair that you have and there's only two companies that are there, um, people are going to feel pretty good about the fact that a business has stepped up and got involved in that library initiative or entrepreneurship event or 
whatever that would be. So I think loyalty is a factor. I also think duration is a factor. So, um, you know, is an impression, what's the length of time on an impression? Is an impression one minute or one hour? And um, they're very different. So is somebody, you know, is it sustainable? I, you know, I, um, a sign at a basketball game that somebody's looking at for two hours, um, that's a pretty powerful impression as opposed to something that, you know, you may turn by in a news, literally in an old school newspaper or scroll on your iPhone and see it for a second. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot of apples and oranges there. So I think, you know, sustained duration, loyalty um, are a couple of factors that definitely play in it. Right. Um, so, so with the, uh, the reach, um, you know, some assets are going to be a lot easier to, to measure the reach. Uh, and we talked about the website before, uh, very easy to know exactly how many people are coming to a website and seeing a particular page, yep. things like signage, a lot trickier. Um, so in, in those cases, uh, you know, an educated guess, I guess is probably best to, uh, to determine kind of what the reach is. Yeah. You know, it's, that's a really good point. Like people are very uh, sort of terrified of making educated guesses. You know, terrified of the concept of projections. And you do it all the time. It's predicting a score in the Super Bowl. People aren't afraid to say, what's your prediction? And I predict it's going to be 30 to 23. They don't panic. They don't say, well, that's crazy. I don't know what the score is going to be. It's a stupid question. You can't ask me. I'm not going to answer. Well, what's your projected attendance at a festival? Well, I have no idea. How can I project? Well, you had 20,000 people last year. Well, but it could rain. Yeah, it could. But you have a bunch of factors that predict that. And use the word approximate or estimate. So you can make all kinds of estimates. You know, what's the value of my sign or what are the impressions? Well, it's approximately. Approximate's a great word. Approximate has a lot of range to it. Estimate, I predict, I project, it's approximate. You're on solid ground, but I think one of the problems a lot of people have, and I'm saying a lot of people on the call here, is by being afraid to answer the question, sponsors aren't interested. If you want to know a really quick way for companies to walk away, when you say, how many people are you going to have? At your, you guys are doing a new event. How many people are you going to have there? And the question will be answered, asked that way. How many people are you going to have? Tendency is to say, I don't know. I'm not sure, or give a very vague range. Oh, we could have any amount. That's the first time we're doing it. Terrible answer. The answer should be we're going to have approximately 12,000 people. So, or 6,000 or two, whatever the number you think. But that's the right answer. You want to be definitive and concise, but leave yourself room. And not exaggerate, but leave yourself room to say, um, or if things go well, we'll have 12,000 people or, you know, based on passes, you know, use those other words. But I just think people are very fearful of projections and predictions and cost you money by not projecting or predicting results. A lot of your corporate partners are going to say no interest. You guys can't even, you're not even comfortable saying what you expect is going to happen here. And I think people are very, again, reluctant to do it. It's similar to a budgeting process. It's an exercise, you know, just go do it. All right. So All right. on, um, I know on, on the digital front as well, in some cases, um, you know, branded content on, on Facebook and things like that are, uh, are identified as assets nowadays and, and sold. And, um, you know, one, one way very similarly, you can kind of go about doing that is looking at, uh, similar posts that you've had in the past and kind of what the reach, uh, was of those, uh, of those posts. And then, you know, if the, if the sponsorship includes. 10 posts um, that are tied with that sponsor and around that, that, that program, um, then you can just kind of multiply out and, and use that as a bit of a projection. So, uh, so again, as Carrie mentioned, you know, there, there's ways to make an educated guess, um, but uh, it's, it's really important to, to, you know, progress the sponsorship process. Otherwise you kind of get stuck at the. Yeah. And it's an educated guess. It's not a guess. It's educated. You, you guys speaking, you know, that are here have a huge education on your own, property and event. So when you make a prediction, it's educated, but make a prediction. And sometimes you're going to be way off. So that, so be it. But, you know, um, you're more likely than not going to be uh, relatively accurate. And again, companies are looking for decisiveness. They're not looking for some, um, for 
indecisive or vague. Um, and, and again, I, 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 I hear that a lot. I hear a lot of companies, a lot of events and organizations are, are terrified to come up with predictions and projections and it, it, it's to their own detriment. Um, so up to this point, you know, we've talked about uh, developing a bit of a CPM. We've talked about trying to define kind of what the um, what the reach potential is. So your spreadsheet is now starting to look a little bit like this. It's populated with uh, your benchmark rates, your assets, your descriptions, and uh, and you'd fill in the next column there with uh, uh, with your reach. Um, so that's really that's two of the the variables that go into determining what the value of a particular sponsorship asset is. Um, the next, and, and this is really kind of the full equation here, the third one that we haven't talked about is, is brand value. And that's that's the third uh, variable. And the one that's a little bit, it's more unique to sponsorship than, uh, than advertising. Advertising is primarily built on uh, CPMs and, and reach. And if you think of things like uh, Google display ads or outdoor ads, you're buying them because you're reaching a large audience. You're not necessarily buying them um, there's not really as much loyalty to a particular brand, you know, buying outdoor advertising through Patterson versus Astral, not really a big difference. Um, but when it comes to sponsorship, that's a little, little, um, the, the more unique part to it is that the, there's that brand value of the property that you're sponsoring. Yeah. Um, so the first two, you know, first two variables, a little bit more objective, you know, you can, you can look at, you know, things like benchmarks and industry standards. You can, you know, do your best educated guesses on, on reach and things like that, but brand value really gets into that more subjective. Um, and how, I mean, how do you try to determine what, what's our brand worth and how is that um, elevating the value of our, of our sponsorship assets? Well, I think loyalties, you know, again, we talked about earlier loyalty, you know, NASCAR is sort of known for this, that um, if Jeff Gordon drives a Tide car, his fans use Tide, they won't use Cheer. Now you'd think, well, that's ridiculous. How would they? use Tide, what if they don't think it's a good product? They don't care if it's a good product. They'll assume that if Jeff Gordon's using it, it's a pretty good product, and most products in general are pretty good. Um, but there's a real, what's the, there's a real brand value to NASCAR that it has a direct return on investment for people that are tied into it. And the same thing to different levels of extent, you know, it's your point, Someone's not going to um, invest in a company because they bought an ad on a particular billboard. It doesn't even make sense to say that. Oh well, I'm going to I'm going to go to that restaurant because I like Patterson and they bought a Patterson billboard. It doesn't make sense. But um, because we're in you know the entertainment business, there's people that have an affinity or get attached to your brand, and ultimately they're going to that's going to impact decisions and there's activations on site and there's certain giveaways and there's sampling and there's booths and there's all kinds of things that allow um, uh, connectivity and a bit an ability for companies to showcase that so um, there's lots of things that you can do in an event event with sustained period of time and people are there that um, that sort of help define what that brand value is and it is something different really is hard to say that again radio or newspaper or TV. it's why sometimes on radio you'll have a um, some of the most effective ads or you'll get celebrities that are speaking you know matthew mcconaughey does car ads derek jeter did gillette ads for all. they do that you know why are these companies why is tim Horton spending millions of dollars to have Sidney crosby they're not doing it for their health they're doing it because the belief is that if Sydney, if Tim Hortons, if I like Sydney Crosby and Sydney Crosby likes Tim Hortons, therefore I should like Tim Hortons. And there's a long history of proof that that works. So um, again, there is, um, you know, and if you don't have Sydney access to Sydney Crosby at your festival, the fact that people love the Winona Peach Festival, that can be enough. That if I love the Winona Peach Festival and there's a company that um, is selling, you know, uh, TELUS is sponsoring the Winona Peach Festival, well, maybe I, uh, maybe I should like TELUS. And plus, you're in a good frame of mind when you're at that event. You're having fun. You're doing a lot of other things that may be conducive to buying a new cell phone. Um, so 
I know I kind of answered it in five different ways there, but I, I think that it's important that you guys understand and I'm biased, but I think there's a lot more brand value in the things we're talking about. I'm a big believer that sponsorship is generally a really good investment if you guys as events make sure you deliver as opposed to some static advertising. And by the way, including online, I generally think sponsorship in a lot of ways is better than advertising on Facebook because Facebook is no different than advertising in the Toronto Star in the sense it's not loyalty. Very few people are going to say, well, I love Facebook and I saw an ad on Facebook, therefore I'm going to buy those cosmetics. It doesn't tend to go that way. But again, um, you become a fan of a team or an event, there's a direct connection. So I think in this area, that brand value is really important. It's real. It has, it actually has, um, affects buyer behavior. Yeah. Um, another one we were, we were talking about, um, uh, before we, we came on was, uh, you know, targeted in a niche. And I know you were mentioning an example with, uh, with the Toronto rush yeah. and, and how, you know, because it was so niche and targeted that, you know, brands could see a real. Yeah. Value. So we work with, we helped start ultimate Frisbee. So I know some of you guys may play ultimate Frisbee and we were involved about five years ago in starting the ultimate Frisbee league in, uh, throughout North America and the Toronto rush are one of the marquee teams. And. So from day one, very few sponsors. Um, and then TELUS came on in a big way. And people that played Ultimate um, talked about how cool it was that TELUS was associated with Ultimate Frisbee. And they felt really good about it. And that translated into behavior. They weren't talking about TELUS being a better provider than Bell. It wasn't in the discussion. So the person that switched to TELUS didn't so if they're the same, now tell us is worse, but if they're similar and tell us supports ultimate and I've been playing ultimate Frisbee my whole life and it's an emerging sport, why would I not buy tell? You almost have to find me a reason to not use tell us. And again, a lot of you guys have very, you're in interesting niches and there's people that are passionate about those niches. So I think what you have to do is convey to the sponsor, convince the tell of the world that this is real. That if you do engage and you are a part of this, it's going to have a real business effect. So it's it's good on its own, but TELUS isn't a charity. And again, I think we talked about this, or you know, we will throughout the series. Is one fundamental mistake, and municipalities are as bad as anybody, is saying, "Hey, can you do us a favor and support us?" That's a terrible mindset. It's a very poor approach. Um, TELUS doesn't want to do you a favor. And if they do do you a favor, it's not sustainable. So that's not a healthy way to have a partnership. Partnership is, is good for both parties. And again, what's exciting is what you guys have to offer. That uh, there's, there's, well, you know, you're all, many of you are ultimate Frisbee examples. You're not, we're not dealing with Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment on this call or big monstrosities. We're dealing with organizations that, um, that target smaller groups and segments. And again, it's exciting. But you, you know, you guys that are listening, you have to believe in it. If you feel like, hey, we don't have a sponsor and this company is doing us a favor, but we need to bring in more sponsorship money and let's get people to help us out. Uh, I think I said for those who are in, there's way better charities. So I would say if any of you guys are asking that sort of shame on you guys, let people support the hospital. Like there's a lot better charities. If it's a charity investment, um, it shouldn't be an event or municipality or sports team. If it's a business investment, uh, that's a whole different thing. Right. The, the brand value, I guess, is really where, where organizations can, can compete because we, you know, we talked about the reach, you know, uh, if you start trying to get into competing on reach, you know, you're going to lose to Google or yep. you know Patterson or these organizations that have tremendous reach. Um, but it's, it's really, if, if you're able to articulate that value, like yep. you said, um, that's where the CPMs go up. That's right. where the brand value uh, can go up. And that's where, well, it's it's where you guys have a competitive that. advantage. You guys have a huge advantage. The other, the other forms of advertising can't compete on brand value. So you guys have a big advantage. So, you know, but not everybody uses it. 
So, uh, so we talked a fair bit about, you know, this objective versus subjective thing. And I know this is kind of an, another example. Um, you know, we talk about a fair bit that it's, it's not necessarily about being the best product. Um, and we also talked about at the beginning, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily about how much it, how much it costs to produce. So, you know, the example being, you know, uh, you know, Bic razors versus Gillette razors, you know, cost to produce, you know, probably pretty similar and, and the quality of, of, uh, you know, shave that's going to going to give you is probably, you know, pretty similar, maybe Gillette's maybe marginally better, but price is 10 times, 10 times more expensive. You know, same thing with, you know, Toyota and Lexus, you know, most people buy a car to get them from, from A to B. Toyota and a Lexus are probably going to do uh, pretty well the same job of getting you to A to B, but some people opt to, to buy the Lexus. So um, that's really kind of that subjective value, I guess, uh, in play. Yeah, and it works. People become attached to their brands. They believe that Molson beer is better than Molson Canadian is better than Blue Ri Paps Blue Ribbon when they really don't know what they're talking about. But they're tied to, hey, I'll get a Canadian. You know, give me a Coors Light. It's give me a, or I'll go to Tim Hortons. Or like you said, I'll want Gillette razors because Derek Jeter used it. With so I'm saying it's effective. People have their favorites. They have their passions. They have products that they believe in. Um, and, you know, one thing I would say, you know, if you, you guys that are sitting uh, right now, you're sitting listening to this, look, or, you know, you may think, well, my office doesn't have logos all over it. And I would challenge you. I say you have logos all over your room. So when you turn on your computer, there is a Microsoft logo that comes up. When you look at your computer, I'm looking at an HP logo right in front of me. When you turn your phone on, there's an Apple logo that comes on. When you go to your search engine, there's a Google logo that comes on. When you stand up, you have Levi's on your pants and um, Under Armour on your shirt and Tommy Hilfiger on your uh, undershirt and um, whatever, Nike on your shoes and Toyota. When you get in your car, you have Toyota in the car and you have a brand name. So what I'm saying is it's inundated. So anybody who doesn't think and the pen you're holding has a Staples logo on it, and the it doesn't stop. So I think people somehow think that they're unattached to brands and that because we're not walking around and there's a big McDonald's logo on my wall, that somehow I'm unaffected. Whereas you probably, where you're sitting right now, you can probably see a hundred logos, um, 50 logos. So, People are very attached to brands. It, it, it has an impact. And, and it's not coincidental that when you turn your phone on Apple, make sure you see an Apple. They don't have to have an Apple. They can have a blank screen. Why do they do that? Why would they possibly have an Apple? It's not, why do they do that? It could be a blank white screen. It could be a landscape shot. Why would they do that? They do that because they want that to be in your head that you associate and you have a certain affinity for that brand. Yeah. Another um, uh, subjective um uh, point about, you know, increasing the, the value on, on the subjective is, um, you know, the results of, of sponsorship might vary quite differently, uh, you know, amongst different companies. So, you know, if, if Tim Hortons acquires, you know, one customer one time, that might only be worth uh, a few dollars. If Toyota gets a customer or Lexus gets a Toyota, that could be thousands and thousands yeah. of dollars just from one customer. So yeah. um, part of that subjective value also comes from you know, what, what's the, the actual results of the sponsorship worth to that company? Well, it's also, I think there's a big, um, and again, I, it's probably straying off topic a little bit here, but there's a big misconception when someone says, well, you know, $10,000 is a lot of money for Swiss Chalet to spend on a sponsorship of with Toyota. Well, you're not Toyota. In other words, $10,000, people tend to think of themselves as if $10,000 would be a lot of money for you, the person that we're talking to right now. Why is $10,000 a lot of money? It is if you can't measure a return, but if you feel like you can sell a car, as you say, or sell two cars or sell three cars, it's a very small amount of money. And you just have to demonstrate that you can do that, that you have an ability to sell cars as a result of the sponsorship. But I think people can tend to get caught up on kind of, as you said, what's a lot of money to an individual company or, you know, can we really price it at that? I think it really, you've got to make sure the value is there. That's really what it is. Yeah. Um, so just 
just wanted to kind of quickly go back to uh, to our equation here. So, so brand value, you know, as as abstract of a concept and as uh, as tough as it can be to really uh, really define in the, in the purposes of our of our um, equation here is expressed as a multiplier. So it might be you know, one point five times kind of the value of what that that traditional media might be worth, or it might be five times uh, in some cases. So um, that's really the exercise that that you guys have to do as experts of your organizations, your properties and assets is try to determine what that brand value multiplier is. Um, so uh, so that kind of, um, so now that we have that, we've got our CPM, we've got a reach, we've got our brand value multiplier. Now that's going to give us kind of what the value of the, of the asset is. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that there's there this again this is there's an art and a science to this it's not there's no universally accepted way to value assets it's not completely um 100 objective uh we've tried to you know throughout this presentation kind of show uh this the art and the science the objective and the subjective but uh, it really is a, a mix of both um and when, when setting kind of values and, and when determining you know what to include them in, in in a proposal or something like that um you know we also you know tend to you know, to aim a little bit on the high side as well, because just kind of baked into this sponsorship process is uh, negotiation and, and discounting. And that just tends to kind of come with the, uh, come with the territory. Um, it's also very, if you, if you kind of go too low off the, off the, the bat, it's very hard to increase. Uh, it's always, you always have that option to come down yeah. um, in the negotiation and everything. So yeah. um, as much as, you know, we've shown kind of ranges on the low end and the high end for different inventory and coming up with the brand value, uh, probably safer to, to aim a little bit high than, uh, than to aim low. Yep. Great. So, so up to this point now, we, we've now kind of talked about uh, what sponsors want and how to understand what they want. We've also talked about what do we have to offer them. Uh, so the kind of the natural question is, okay, well, how do we, how do we articulate that to, to sponsors? Um, so Carrie talked a lot about, you know, be, having to confidently articulate that value um, as being really the only way to, um, to, uh, uh, to convince, you know, a sponsor that a partnership is, is the right thing, uh, for, for their business. So, so how to articulate that? So we've kind of, it's very, you know, uh, at least as an introduction, we're going to talk about this in a, in, a, in um, a future episode, but at least as a, as a starting point, uh, you want to think of it in these kind of questions and, and starting with why, and, and your first meeting with the sponsor is really talking to them about their business and doing a bit of that needs analysis. Um, what has worked for them in the past? Uh, what, what objectives are they trying to achieve? So the first question you want to try to answer is why should they even continue the conversation? Why do you see uh, an initial fit uh, for a partnership? Uh, and why should they continue to listen? Uh, the second is who. So really important to, to that particular sponsor is they want to know that somewhere in the audience that, that your property or event represents, there, there lies some of their potential customers. Uh, so they want to know who's at your event. They want to know uh, as much as you know about them they want to know how many people are, are at your event, how many people they're going to reach. Uh, so the more you know, you know, about the people that are coming to your event, the demographics, uh, but also, you know, the psychographics and the, and the behavioral kind of stuff, the better you're going to be able to articulate to that sponsor that your potential customers are here. Um, so that partnership makes, makes a lot of sense. Yep. Um, so the other ones, you know, when and, and, and where, um, you know, we talked about, that being, you know, a bit of a difference between advertising and sponsorship is, you know, is the when. So, you know, in outdoor advertising uh, with billboards, you know, you might be reaching people when they're sitting in their car, uh, they're on their way home from work, they're they're hungry, you know, they're sitting in traffic. Maybe not the best frame of mind to be in, but when you're at a, you know, a hockey game, for example, or a basketball game, you're reaching people for a pretty good duration, but you're also reaching them when they're in a really good mood. Uh, so that has to be worth something too, right? Yeah, and, and I just touch on, we only got, I think, 10 minutes or so to go here, so I don't really get into length you could do a whole hour on that topic but i think people are in a good frame of mind when they're at your events typically and i think that has a value hard to define you know and this is where again people say well what does that work um something significant and it depends on your event and what it is but i think there's nothing wrong with saying that one of the advantages of partnerships with us is the frame of mind people are in when they come to our events i think that um has an impact unto itself right um, so along the same lines as the where, you know, where are the people when you're reaching them? Um, you know, in, in the case of the, most of the people on this call, it's probably you're reaching people when they're on their leisure time, you're reaching them when they're with their friends or family out of their home. Um, so that has to be worth something as opposed to, um, you know, being interruptive and then disturbing them, 
you know, while they're listening to the radio or TV or at home or things like that. So, so the when and the where, uh, both, uh, both important. Um, so you'll see, you know, the, the next one, you know, being what, um, you know, tends to be, you know, people kind of jump the gun a lot and then jump to the what right off the bat and say, here's the, uh, here's our gold package. These are the assets that are included in it. And that's really the what, the, the what is the inventory that, that we're going to use to help activate your brand to our audience. Um, so you want to kind of keep that for a little bit later. And, and once you've answered all those initial questions first, but then you do want to say, you know, these are the assets that we think align with your objectives and this is how they're going to reach, um, your potential customers in our audience. Yeah. Uh, and then the last one being how, how are we going to define success? So in the initial meeting with a potential sponsor, you're trying to understand what their objectives are um, and what would a successful partnership look like to them. Um, and you want to kind of close out, um, you know, articulating that value to them saying, this is, this is how we're going to define success um, through this partnership. So. Great. So, so that kind of brings us to, uh, to the end of the presentation for today. So, um, Hopefully, you know, the takeaways are that, you know, there's there's an objective way to, to kind of go about valuing sponsorship assets, um, but a lot of it is, is more of an art and trying to understand that abstract concept of brand value and, and what um, what your brand is worth compared to, you know, buying just traditional advertising. Um, so hopefully uh, some good takeaways um, coming from today. Um, so we're, with that, we're going to move into some Q and A um, for the last few minutes here. So um, yeah, Rebecca, any uh, any questions? Yeah. So we had a comment from our live chat, actually, just touching on the potential uh, reach that your event could have, and they mentioned that it's much easier for indoor events to predict crowd size as compared to outdoor events when weather can really mess things up. So do either of you have any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah, I think my comment is make predictions. So I hear that, but you have to predict based on, you know, typical what the weather would be. And there's a range. And if the, you know, you the other thing too, when you make predictions, you can make predictions based, they can be optimistic projections, you know, to say that um, we predict that we're going to have 20,000 people at our event. Um, people understand that it's weather um weather permitting and that that's going to have an effect if it's and you know if you have twenty thousand one year and you have eight thousand the next year because of the weather i think people understand that uh so again i think that the mistake to me is to either not predict or to be overly cautious and say well we're gonna have two thousand people because we're basing this on a thunderstorm for the whole day yeah. okay that's the wrong prediction yeah it could happen but the prediction is that um, in four out of five years, there won't be rain. So if in four out of five years, there won't be rain, that means there's an 80% chance there won't be rain. That means that's your prediction. So uh, I say that that's the answer. So to me, I guess the short is easy to, you know, I think any event that you have, even if it's a first time event, event, they're easy to predict. As far as traffic, just don't get caught up on that. I think there's, there's, um, it's something you have to sort of get yourself past. Um, so our second question, this individual wanted to know, if I readjust my evaluation that I've used in years past, should I grandfather the pricing to current partners or renegotiate? It's a good, really good question. I think uh, case by case, I think there are grandfatherings, a good concept oftentimes where you have companies that have spent, you know, you may look at it and, and I think what that allows you to do is comfortably change prices. So let's say you have a sponsor and they've come in for $500 and you feel like they've way underpaid. Your value is $5,000, but you don't want to lose home hardware because they've come in at $500 and they've been doing it for 10 years. And I think it's a way to, um, that people can appreciate. So if you reprice it at $5,000 and Harvey's comes in and they find out that a company uh, was paying less in theory. I think people can appreciate, well, that was a grandfathered rate. That's only for companies that started prior to 2018. Um, so I think it's an advantage to do that. And I think it's a good way. So, cause the argument is don't be afraid to raise your prices. And if you feel like there are certain organizations that should be grandfathered to help you do that, I'd say, absolutely go ahead and do it. It's a great question because it's often, one that's misunderstood or somebody would say, well, we have to raise our prices for everybody. I think there is some, um, remember too, that company, 
uh, may have paid you $500 for 10 years, which is $5,000. And they've done a lot of other things when other companies wouldn't have. So I think there's, um, uh, it can often be warranted. So another question from our chat, um, what time of year is best to approach potential sponsors? This individual says they've heard everything from too early to too late. What are kind of your thoughts on that? So it's never too early or too late. I think December is the only time it's probably not great. So you've got the good news is you pretty got a, pretty much got 11 months in the year where so anywhere from the beginning of January to the beginning of December. Um, I think again, December, you know, December is unique. Uh, probably even though just the last two and a half, three weeks of December. Um, but any other time is good. And if you're, you know, you say too early. So let's say you go and pr pr uh, approach RBC and you have an event coming up in June and they say our budgets are set, well, then talk about next June. Don't leave the meeting. So if they say, well, our budgets are set for this year, say, great. What about the 2019 event? Um, why don't we talk about that yeah. if that's the case? So, and, you know, I they'll tell you if you're too early. So if you go talk, call somebody now in January and it's a company that makes decisions 60 days before, let them tell you that. Um, I think part of the important thing out of that is that companies are all different. They have different fiscal years. Some plan well in advance. Some do last minute. Again, you sort of have to, for lack of a better word, get out of your own way. And don't worry about as much about being too early and too late. It's just move forward and let the companies will tell you that. They'll say, were well, you too early or you're too late? Yeah. And if you're too early, there's a time that's right. And if you're too late, uh, the good thing in most cases here, you guys have multiple years of multiple events. I guess if it's if it's a one-off event, it could be too late for that event, but maybe something else. Um, so another question we had was, uh, who should pay for the signage and activation at an event, myself or the sponsor, and how does that factor into the valuation assessment? Great question. Always the sponsor. So two things are additional from cost. The, the two additional things are, tax, HST, and production installation. So the cost should be, if you get somebody to spend $2,000 and then it ends up costing you $1,500 to put the signs up and build the signs, it's really a $500 sponsorship. And the good news, just like, like taxes, people are used to paying for production, but make it really clear, you know, the cost of this is $1,000 plus production. Um, and make sure that's up front. It's a, again, a good question because people tend to um, be confused on that, but to me, it's a really clear answer. I mean, if they're, they're once in a blue moon, there'll be a company that says, I need to know the all in price, including production. And when they do make sure that that price goes up, evaluate, say, okay, it'll cost $1,500 to produce this. So I'm going to raise the full value of $1,500, but those cases are, um, you really want to be in the mindset that production and taxes are extra um, and that you can net the amount. So if it's $1,000, that you can clear $1,000 in your um, And then kind of our last one from the chat, uh, someone indicated that from their experience, certain sponsors only want local representation. They don't want countrywide representation. What are kind of your thoughts on that? Local representation. Yeah, I guess just from a sponsorship standpoint, they don't want a regional presence. I, I think if I mean, not sure if I understand the question exactly, but I think if it's if the if it's saying to talk to somebody locally, I, I think what I would say on that is you always want to start locally. So, for instance, I think the mistake is to take some of these big brands and say, um, and this, by the way, is very you know good for. Um, for most of you guys listening to this. So if you're in Oshawa and you may think, um, I don't know, Canadian Tire, I have to call somebody in Calgary. You don't. The person that's gonna make the decision is in Oshawa. It's the manager of the Canadian Tire in Oshawa or maybe the group manager, the regional manager. Um, they're not gonna make head office decisions. They're not gonna be made for things going on, going on in Oshawa. So you do, the tendency is start locally and don't stress yourself out about, um, hey, I'm not in, you know, sending an email or filling out a form to Canadian Tire in Calgary is not gonna get done. The person that's gonna sell that package is the 
person that runs the two local Canadian tires that are in your city. Uh, so that's actually a great segue into uh, uh, to our next episode, uh, which uh, coming up February 21st, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, we're going to talk about who to reach out to for sponsorship and the just talk about the prospecting process. Uh, so that's coming up. Uh, but that kind of wraps up our, our uh, episode for today. So thanks very much again to Central County's Tourism and Sport Durham for uh, giving us the opportunity to host this webinar series. And um, we welcome you know feedback from everybody. And again, if you have any questions, uh, didn't get a chance to get a question into the live chat, um, go to cosmosports.com and you can find our emails there and happy to, to clarify or answer any questions there. Uh, otherwise, we will see everybody. Hopefully and I would, I would just, sorry, just add, add one thing for everybody goes. I mean, the other thing too is if anybody, I mean, a lot of this comes in, you know, it's pretty general and generic. I mean, if anybody wants to specifically talk to us about their specific situation, you know, we welcome that. So, you know, reach out to Evan or Rebecca or myself to say, look, we have, you know, this wasn't addressed on the webinar or we have, um, specific things we do on our end or or maybe we could use some help in some other area so again um, the webinars are going to hopefully be very helpful but they're not perfect and they're not all encompassing and we're talking to a lot of people at once so I think if if again anybody wants to um, talk to us individually about their situation um, we're easy to find okay. Okay. Well, thanks very much everybody thank you